All right, and we are live uh, because every stream video on YouTube needs to start with an awkward thing where you announce to a live audience that you're live. <laughs> uh, welcome, welcome everybody. This is, of course, the monthly tradition uh, subscriber appreciation day for September, already September of all things in 2017. And I'm here today with my buddy Cheryl, the roving naturalist, and she just started up uh, probably in like late August a new YouTube channel that is based on a lot of data gathered through the uh, We Created You community and also through some of the interviews and stuff you did at VidCon, so hi. Mm -hmm. So should you, uh, you should start by introducing yourself. Sure. Um, so hi, I'm Cheryl. I'm a master's student in biology, hopefully moving on towards my doctorate. And I run the Roving Naturalist, like Tristan said. So it's a channel that combines my love of nature and outdoors with my background in science and science communication to try to not just spit facts at people about the natural world and biology, but really sort of try to form an emotional connection with people and help more people understand why it's important that we care about the environment. Nice. Now, um, I'm gonna keep talking, I, tell me a bit more about how you got everything started while I <laughs> make this a public event <laughs> and not one that's unlisted. <laughs> uh. <laughs> um, well, so I guess how things got started is sort of twofold because there's the how I got started being a grad student story and the how I got started on YouTube story. Um, so I got started on YouTube uh, like three years ago now, I guess. Uh, I had a different channel, same sort of idea, um, but wasn't very successful because I was brand new and learning a lot and I'm a bad millennial. I'm not very good at technology things. <laughs> um, so I sort of messed around and learned a lot of the hard lessons about YouTube with that first channel. And as I was doing all of that, I met Jacqueline and uh, became part of the We Create EDU community, which was an awesome experience and a lot of great resources. And eventually I realized that maybe I should just make a hard stop and start over again. Um, so the Roving Naturalist is the new result of all of those um, things that I learned <laughs> so hopefully it'll be a little more successful, and I'll do a better job um, engaging people in what I'm doing. And what are you uh, what are you planning on doing with it? Um, so I've been posting videos. I think I've been pretty consistent once a week, which is kind of amazing considering <laughs> how busy I am at the start of the semester. Uh, but yeah, so hopefully videos every week or every other week. Um, doing a combination of vlogging outside, interviewing um, scientists, especially early career scientists, because I want to help people understand what it's like to, you know, be a grad student in biology or how research works. Um, and also some, you know, straight up fact videos, um, analyzing papers, talking about things. I've got a really cool a DIY crafty type project for the Halloween collaboration coming up. So mm -hmm. all, all different kinds of environmentally related things. Oh man. Yeah, that was, um, <laughs> it's going to be a fun one. I, I don't know if I put a picture out on Twitter because I went to the studio yesterday. I saw that. That was an awesome costume. Oh, goodness. It, <laughs> so we went to the dollar store because that's the only place that has, like, the Halloween pop shops haven't started open up yet. So I had to go to the dollar store for all of my Halloween needs. This is a dollar store that was so well stocked. They didn't have plastic vampire teeth. Oh, no. But they did have gummy vampire teeth. Oh, you know, that's the good compromise, yeah. <laughs> those were so, uh, and I, I just was thinking about them because I was like, this is like the worst, like it's literally candy that you're designed to put on top of your teeth. Like I was just like, okay, whatever. Um, <laughs> they were probably designed and marketed by dentists though. Think about it. Oh God, yeah, <laughs> keep them in the work. Um, <laughs> but then like everything was from the dollar store. So I bought like, because I was, I originally planning um, when I was going to put a little bit more effort into this video to start off with like a Nosferatu type, like, mm -hmm. like night, like, you know, black and white bald Dracula yeah. look. And then partway through switch to like the pointed Cape, um, like mid century Dracula. And then at the end I was just going to put like body glitter on me or something. And, <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> the kind of the Edward near the end. But uh, <laughs> then I thought it was funny to just put all of them on at once. And um, yeah. the bald cap turned out to be what I think was like literally a tan balloon cut in half. There's. <laughs> I was wondering about that. I was like, is he going to put a wig on top or is that supposed to be a bald cap? Because it definitely didn't match the rest of your face. <laughs> no, but I think worse is better. And also came across this like fake blood that was made mm -hmm. of like super, super thick like cherry syrup stuff. Basically, yeah. <laughs> like it's basically candy, like, like syrup candy that goes inside like a fake blood bag. Mm -hmm. And that um, we had, it was, it, there's going to be a lot of fun bloopers. I think I'm going to make a blooper video just for this one because <laughs> I went through a lot of crazy stuff with it. But yeah, that's, um, that's something that I can announce to everybody is that the, next week, the first batch of videos that I recorded back in August is done. So um, the next video, the one that comes out next week is the last video from that that I filmed in August. And so uh, another <clears throat> batch of videos are going to be ready, hopefully, right on time so that I you know, can just keep the track going. And uh, I recorded yesterday. That's very exciting. <laughs> it, I, shooting is probably my favorite, probably one of my favorite parts of doing YouTube, uh, especially when you get to go to the YouTube space and there's all the studio work and everything like that. I almost destroyed a piece of equipment. That was good. What did you almost destroy? Uh, a boom, a mic boom. Oh no. <laughs> so, um, I, so, okay. So like they have these mic stand, like they have these mic booms. Mm -hmm. uh, they're like these telescoping things that you can run an XLR cable through. And I, you're supposed to have it rest in this like metal, like cradle thing which you then screw into these like heavy duty like stands. Okay. And then you can like manipulate it like that. But um, I didn't realize that there was a metal cradle. So I tried to screw the, the boom directly into like the big metal stand thing. And it got stuck on like the threads of a screw. And all of a sudden it was like stuck inside this thing. And Every time I tried to get it out, it was like, you could tell, you could feel it was scratching like the paint on it. And so I had to go get somebody from YouTube to come and, um, come and fix it. And I was like, oh, well, the channel's done. We're going to get kicked out. We're going to get banned from the YouTube space. So. <laughs> I'm so surprised that they don't have like a, like a handler in there with you while you're using it though. Yeah. This is one that uh, Kelly kind of brought up when we were there as well, that, uh, when you go for, so when you get to uh, introduce the space, when you get access, they, they unlock the space for you, which is where you go to this like seminar with like 30 other people where they show you in depth how to book the space. Um, but then, yeah, then they just like, like the first time we went there, we signed up, we got all the equipment and everything. And then we're just in the studio with like thousands and thousands of dollars worth of equipment. And then they just, just say, all right, peace, have fun. <laughs> um, I think the, the assumptions that that indicates are really very interesting. Because um, mm -hmm. I was talking to my husband about this yesterday, be that you'd been allowed to film in the space. And like, oh, isn't it weird that like, the people who are allowed to go and use the space are probably the ones who are more able to afford the fancy equipment in their home studios anyway. But also this weird in, uh, assumption that like, oh, because you've been YouTubing long enough to be able to unlock the space, you should just magically know how to use all that fancy equipment. <laughs> yeah, and, like, we live in a world where, you know, like, the, the bar is not high. It, it's, it's, it's not like you have to have, like, a billion subscribers. It's 10,000, which is, like, if you have been working at it and you have, like, you know, uh, done a reasonable amount of more work, you can get to that in a, a couple years. Mm -hmm. But people have gotten way past that with just their cell phone. And so to instantly be like dropped into something where like you probably should have at least a year of film school before you like figure out what it is you're doing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, it was, it took us like two hours to get completely set up just uh, on our first time. And then about an hour the second time. And I want to say hi to Doughboy DeVito who apparently subscribed to you a few days ago. <laughs> 
So um, yeah, so that so you go to the space and you you like they just put you in this room, um, and you have eight hours. And so we just luckily I have a little bit of a background in audio, and then um, the staff member Benny, my contact at YouTube, he just came in and was like, "All right, I'll just show you how some of these things work." <laughs> And then we had a whole lighting set up and he came in to just check up on us. And um, he was like, this is a really good, it's like kind of like a flattening effect with the lighting. Is that what you were going for? And I was like, oh. Um. <laughs> and so then he also helped us do all the lighting. That was so beautifully like, hey, this is what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, um, because of my, my dumbiness that I like had everything unlisted, we now have some actual viewers here now. So how about you reintroduce yourself <laughs> in the Roving Naturalist channel? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, okay, so again, I'm Cheryl, and I run the Roving Naturalist channel. Um, I'm also a master's student in biology, hoping to move on toward my doctorate, and I've been using a lot of my experiences as a grad student to sort of help me build this channel. I want to give viewers, um, you know, an insider's perspective on what it's like to be a scientific researcher and what it's like to be a grad student. So even though a lot of my videos are me walking around outside and spewing facts at you, I also want to sort of help people gain a connection to nature and you know more of that sort of trust building with the scientific community so that's <laughs> mm -hmm. so if you have any biontology questions this is the right time yes especially um, if they're about bugs i love bugs i yeah i have um i worked on a campus radio show back when i used to live near campus <laughs> and this is the weird thing about that show. Almost everybody who worked on it, like they were all volunteers who came out and almost all of them were biology of some kind or another. That's kind of fun. They didn't like that I called them all biology because they were like, there was one like capital B biologist and then everybody else was in like neuroscience and phys oh. physiology and pharmacology and kinesiology and like, <laughs> um, our school is like a really big uh, medical school. So there's a lot of, or not medical, not medical schools, like biomedical research. Mm -hmm. Well, they all fit um, into the life sciences. Yeah, and I, like, you know, I'm just like, I'm just like, you know, you do work on, in laboratories on living things and not in books. So like, I assume that that's just biology. <laughs> <laughs> hey now, not all of us work in laboratories. <laughs> no, I actually have a friend who does some very, who has had some similar, is in a similar area to the kind of stuff that, you work in and she's um she now runs that show and she was um she's done some pretty fun stuff i mentioned that you made some joke about a pooter um <laughs> and i'm trying to mention that thing to her and she was just like yeah i I'd never heard it called that before and i was like oh maybe it's just an american thing i don't know mm, i don't know i mean like aspirator is the real term but yeah some people call it a pooter <laughs> she spent um yeah she she's she's very familiar with it she um she doesn't work on your typical animals. She works on like spiders, which I guess are harder to get in large numbers. So she was yes. like, a couple years ago, she spent a summer in uh, Greenland looking for spiders because she does like, she's, her research has to do with like how, how arachnids and other arthropods adapt to the cold, like how they survive freezing temperatures. That's cool. Um, so she does a lot of, so she did like something where she went to the Arctic and like grabbed, like collected a whole bunch of spiders to, and then froze them to see how they freeze. That is awesome. Yeah, it's pretty fun. She is a very fun person. <laughs> <laughs> she has a tarantula and everything. It's, um, uh, that's great. Now we catch, um, we catch lots of spiders in the pitfall traps that I use. So it's just like a hole in the ground and the bugs walk across the ground and they fall into this cup and then I can collect them later. Um, so yeah, I think we have a lot of ground predator spiders here, but my advisor is such a goof. Um, he's, he really doesn't like spiders and he definitely is not okay with them while they're still alive. Cause like a spider, they've got such tiny feet that they can kind of like hang out on the surface tension of the water that's in the cup, or they can do like the, you know, with their arms out against all the walls of the cup. So sometimes they'll still be alive in the traps when we go to get them. And he like freaks out and he'll like, like kind of like put a stick down in the cup to try to like make a bridge for them to crawl out so he doesn't have to uh -oh. them. 
that's like this is like an expert. Like you think yeah. that like like I, every person who I know who spends a lot of time handling spiders, all one of them, uh, make a big deal about how everyone else makes way too big a deal about spiders. Yeah, I mean, I don't especially like I. <laughs> I was kind of like, I, I don't usually do the whole screaming and flailing thing about bugs because I love bugs, but like there was this giant, very frightening looking spider on my shoulder the other night while I was eating dinner and I kind of freaked out a little bit. But like if I just saw a spider and it's like on the floor in my house or in one of my traps, I don't really, I don't care that much. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I get it. Like I, um, there's reasonable amounts of studies to say that that's, it's something that's like deeply built into our like lizard yeah. brain. Like, uh, we are to spiders like cats are to cucumbers, I guess, or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> was it cucumbers? I thought it was uh, zucchini. Maybe I'm wrong. I, I, I don't think, I don't know if they, it, you know, zucchini, cucumber, they, they're, they look the same from the outside, um, at least as far as the cat thing goes. I feel like I should I do have a test on my cat. Did you test it on my I, cat? No, I haven't. Um, I should. Torturing cats is fun. I mean, as long as you don't hurt them. <laughs> um, I do have a question. I, okay, we do have some questions. I'm not sure how silly they are, but um, like someone asked. Questions. Somebody asked, "Are moths just colorful mosquitoes?" Ooh, that's a good question. Um, so most insects do have wings, but the way that we partition out like what group of insects they belong to is often more about like their mouth parts or some other part of their habits. So um, moths are part of the same group as butterflies. They have four you know, big wings that have scales on them. That's why people say don't touch the wings on a butterfly because if you rub the scales off, um, on your finger, their wings don't work anymore. But mosquitoes, mosquitoes have one pair of membranous wings, you know, they're see-through, kind of like the wings on a bee. Um, but their second pair of wings is actually this funny little, they look kind of like, um, like dumbbells almost, you know, like doing weights at the gym kind of thing. They're called haltiers, and they sit on the mosquito's back behind their membranous wings, and they are useful for mosquitoes and other true flies, like the flies in your house, um, although hopefully you don't have any. Um, but the haltiers are good for um, stabilization and balance. That's why mosquitoes and other true flies are so maneuverable, and it's hard to swat them because they can change direction very quickly because of those little dumbbells. So moths and mosquitoes are very different. Although I don't, I never found mosquitoes particularly like evasive. <laughs> they're kind of, they're kind of like, they're like flies after like a few pints, right? Like they just kind of. Like, <laughs> I saw a mosquito, I think, like yesterday, and I realized I'm like, wow, I haven't seen a thing that wasn't like a pigeon or a bee in like months. <laughs> when you said that on my video, I thought that was so sad. I mean, like, pigeons are amazing, and I could go off into this long thing about how much Darwin loved pigeons and how fascinating they are, but, like, at the same time, yeah, you should definitely be getting more exposure to nature than, like, that little bit. <laughs> Listen, they're not, they, these aren't, like, the, the pretty white pigeons. These are, like, the ones that are, like, are literally living oil slicks. Like, yeah. Well, but those gross, are, those are um, like, I mean, when I worked at the wildlife rehab, we didn't call them pigeons. We called them rock doves because that's um, just like uh, dogs are all technically wolves. All domestic pigeons are technically rock doves. But yeah, the ones that have like the oil slick heads and then the sort of like slate gray backs, that's the like the natural or like mutt version of a pigeon. So like not the fancy bread one. Yeah. Yeah, because like um, it's because I remember like um, in like Darwin's time, like this is like going like veering off into like the little history of like, pigeons used to be like selectively bred. Like they had like pure breed, like breeds of pigeons. And then um, they were also commonly eaten if I recall, like people used yeah. to like eat pigeon. I think you can still find it in like really high end French cuisine, but like yep. the idea of eating pigeon is like, ugh. <laughs> it's called squab because that sounds fancy. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think squab sounds very appetizing. But yeah, you can you can um, find pigeon in a restaurant if it's called squab. Um, but yeah, like that's and that's actually what Darwin wrote about in Origin of the Species was how all of those different breeds of pigeon they've got fancy shaped beaks or ruffs of feathers on their heads or even just the different colors. How all of that artificial selection 
um, lends credence to the idea that um, selection could also happen naturally. Mm -hmm. I also like this, um, this, this summary that moths are boring butterflies. <laughs> um. I, I also don't know if I would say they were boring. Um, moths are nocturnal butterflies, but if you've ever seen, um, there are moths that have like a wing reveal thing. So when a moth is sitting still, its top wings kind of rest over or cover its back wings. Um, but if a predator sneaks up on a moth, a lot of them can flip open those top wings and reveal the bottom wings. And the bottom wings have really brightly colored like pink and orange eye spots um, to try to scare away the predator. So I think moths are secretly exciting. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, um, my sister is like pathologically afraid of them for some reason. But, um, and then my wife is pathologically afraid of butterflies. So like, I don't know. How, yeah, Kelly hates butterflies, right Kelly? She's not responding. She's not responding. <laughs> that is a fun fact, I did not know that. <laughs> she doesn't, uh, I don't know, it's about, she doesn't like when they land on her. Or something. Hmm. I don't know. Okay. I heard a groan from the other room. <laughs> um, I like I, the only thing I, I can I can like safely feel assured in like human superiority because of moths because I can just be like, "Ha, you think that's the moon?" <laughs> and then, I feel like we could come up with a long list of things that people have duped themselves into believing. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, so who do we have? Who do we have in the chat here today? We have Doughboy DeVito. Doughboy DeVito is a longtime subscriber, the person who apparently has subscribed to the Roving Naturalist. Yay! Good on ya. <laughs> We've got Kogito here. You know him? Uh, I don't know. He's, he's got the History Channel. Um, he does like a cool, he has these like kind of cute little things that he makes for his videos. Oh, oh, yes. Okay, yeah. And mythology guy. Mm. Um, let's see, come on, guys, give me some. Uh, what's, what do you guys want to know? What do you guys want to know about living things? <laughs> All living things. <laughs> All living things. Well, yeah, you, someone just said they didn't know about the hidden wings thing, so therefore you won on that one. Yes. Ooh, another thing that makes moths exciting. Um, so you can tell the difference between a male moth and a female moth by looking at their antennae. So their antennae are their way of sort of like smelling and tasting their world, their chemical receptors. And male moths have supremely fuzzy, fluffy, big, elaborate antennae um, because they need uh, lots of sensory organs on their antennae in order to smell the sex pheromones of female moths. Oh, so it's not like a um, like the reason why birds make like stupid display, like big flashy displays, or like um, <laughs> um, like those fish that make circles and stuff. No, yeah, no, it's not. It's not sexual selection, as in like female moths prefer males with fancy antennae. It's that the fancy antennae have more sensory receptors on them, so that like male moth that's over here can smell a female moth sometimes like a mile away or more, which is incredible. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Long distance booty call. Well, I imagine like if you're a bug, like everything is super spaced out. So it must be yeah. like, you gotta learn. That's why that they like, they can do that. They are all adapted to do things that if they were scaled up would be ridiculous. Right, yeah. <laughs> like, uh, oh, Nature's Booty Call, there's the quote of the show. Yeah! <laughs> oh, man. Uh. Oh, he was trying to, he was trying to write the same time, so you guys just thought of the same thing at the same time. I got quoted as saying it's fun to torture cats. All right, we're having a good time. <laughs> Okay, I have, here's, here's a good one that actually is something that I've thought of. Why, why can't flies find open windows? Oh my gosh, um, I have wondered the same thing. <laughs> I do not know. Um, you mean I, like, like, yeah, like, why can't they fly out of an open window? Like, they, like if you open a window in a room, how come they don't know? Go towards that. Um, I don't actually know. Cause, I, imagine, yeah, I imagine flies don't have a ton of heuristics. Uh, and their heuristics are probably not super designed for working outside or working inside. So, 
uh, yeah, probably. I yeah, I don't know. I suppose when it comes to like aren't insects like they're pretty simple creatures, so like you can very easily confuse them. Not not like simple in like the like <laughs> I'm sure they got a lot going on, but like as far as like thinking power goes, they they rely on it. Like they they're not super good at like learning and like figuring stuff out and solving problems. Or I think um. Hard. I think that's a dangerous thing to say it's simply because insects is such a huge category. Um, there are a ton of really interesting like animal learning and animal behavior studies that use bees. Um, but just like we see in the rest of nature, the more social you are, like that tends to correlate pretty well with intelligence level to an extent. Um, so yeah, like uh, ants and bees and other eusocial or truly social insects um, do have like the potential to learn. But as far as like a house fly goes, I don't really know. <laughs> Fair enough. Actually, uh, I don't my really wife's- I enough to learn either. Yeah, my wife's former roommate actually did um, bee research. Cool. With um, <clears throat> how, um, bees solve problems, I think, was, like, the general consent, the general thing. Yeah. But, like, um, I was trying to think, I'm trying to remember what she used to do. Uh, I, either way, um, yeah, you meet a lot of crazy <laughs> science people um, just bouncing around grad school. True story. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. Okay, so, <laughs> are babies human? Mm. And then, like, the kind of thinking face. I'm like, uh, okay. <laughs> um, here's one here okay this one's a gimme and I know that you do a lot of kids stuff so this one will be this perfect one what are one of the strangest insect facts you've ever heard of oh man that's such a long list <laughs> do you have a few favorites oh yeah um yeah so I have used several times at nature centers because they're a nice big easy insect to teach with um Madagascar hissing cockroaches um, so everybody knows that there are lots of different insects that make noises of one kind or another, um, but hissing cockroaches are basically the only insect that makes noise via exhalation, so expelling air, just like, I mean, we're making noise via exhalation right now in order to talk, um, but most insects do it via, like, vibrating a membrane or scraping parts of their bodies together, but hissing cockroaches actually do hiss. They've got, um little holes down the sides of their body called spiracles, and all insects have spiracles, that's how they breathe. But the cockroach is able to inflate itself and then um, very quickly sort of squish its body down and force air out of those spiracles, and that's what makes the hissing sound when they're alarmed, so. <laughs> you definitely believe in spiracles. Um, yes. I, I, you know, one more, if we're on the topic of cockroaches, I have a question about them. Why are they indestructible? <laughs> Um, <clears throat> well, so I, I do. I love, I love thinking about that. I don't know why cockroaches specifically are so indestructible, but if you're thinking about the whole like, oh, I can chop its head off and it still runs around thing, uh, that's actually sort of a characteristic of all insects, and it's because of the way their neural networks are structured. So they have a big clump of neurons or brains, or, well, you know, nerve cells that we call a brain in their heads. Um, <clears throat> but they have a whole bunch of other clumps that are almost as important uh, all the way down their sort of like nerve cord. Um, so they have one at the base of their heads that is just in charge of their mouth parts because insects have, instead of just like one jaw like we have, they've got like, you know, four to six different moving parts. So they have one clump of neural cells that's just for operating their mouth parts. And then they have a few smaller clumps down their back that um, control their legs because they've got six legs. So they've got one little clump of nerves that controls each pair of legs and then um, some for like moving their wings too. So technically you can chop the head off an insect and if you do it just right, those other clumps of nerve cells should be able to keep making the legs move for a limited amount of time. <laughs> It's not. It's not even. Uh, it's not even limited to insects. Um, do you ever hear the story about like the chicken that yeah. survived its head getting cut off for like several years? Yeah, I think. Um, I think stories like that. It's mostly that like that like the brain stem gets left in the neck. So if you chop it at like just the right point, you leave enough of the right 
nerves in place to keep running the rest of the body processes. <laughs> I imagine the chicken wasn't that much fun at parties anymore, but you know. No, well, but there was that thing because the guy had to feed it. He just like took pieces of food and like used his finger and like poked them down its throat, which is kind of cool. That's a fun party trick. Yeah, it's it's like a, I don't even, what, what is it even at that point? Um, <laughs> yeah, it was interesting because like um, um, there's also some people who uh, want to know about insect intelligent and insects. Um, I, I actually, um, when you were talking about you sociality and everything like that, that was, uh, I don't know if I've talked about this on stream before, that was after I like completely destroyed my life in like 2007, 2008, um, and I was thinking of going back to university and doing something more specialized, I was going to study you sociality, specifically evolution of it. And then I didn't because of how much high school I would have to redo at the age of 19, so. Yeah. <clears throat> There's also, I mean, you sociality is one of those things that like really fascinates people. And so I feel like the, like there are a ton of people in that field, which isn't to say that like people should be discouraged from researching it. But I think it's, it's something that would be harder to like feel like you've broken into or like you're really making big contributions because like everybody is, is in there. Um, so yeah, I, I guess it depends on what you want to get out of doing research, but some people are more drawn to like the fringes and the unknown places, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this was this was a long time ago. This is almost 10 years ago now. But um, it was, I was interested in like, because like people had found a lot of like fossils of ants and stuff like that. And I was thinking about like, egg, how does, how does like selection work for things like for you sociality and how does it um, go from like, you know, a few uh, members to like these highly specialized multi thousand millions of people colonies. And, um, <laughs> and then also how that would be transferable. Like how come you could have you sociality and insects and also like the naked mole rat and, um, and how does like select, how does something like, um, natural selection select to create a species where 99.9% .9 of the species is sterile. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, okay. Um, There's, that's actually a weird place where like math shows up. Um, the whole idea of kin selection, because kin selection is I'm going to give up my ability to reproduce in order to help my sister or my mom or whoever reproduce. Like, there's if there's this weird math about like um, the the percentage of relatedness between you and the offspring that you're helping raise, and there's this like tipping point where if you are more related to that offspring than like you would be to your own offspring, then it's really yeah, it's strange. Okay. So there's, <laughs> so there's some sort of weird ratio where it's literally a good idea to put all your eggs in one basket in the most literal sense possible. Yeah, well, and if you think about it, it's not even that, like, you know, we say, like, it's a good idea, but it's really um, that, like, your genes, like, the relatedness is what proportion of the genes that are in you are in that offspring, because, of course, like, the genes are what is, uh, are what are driving this selection. So the, the genes want... I don't like to ascribe intent to things, but yeah, the genes yeah. want copies of themselves to be passed on. So yeah, that's where that kin selection is super complicated. <laughs> mm -hmm. I only say I only say good idea because like it's one of those things that's shown up in multiple instances in extremely different species. Like yeah. um, now I could be wrong on this, but I think that like it showed up in ants and termites and stinging insects all at different times, like before they diverge from each other. Um, well... Or after they diverge from each other. Like, they, yeah. like, like bees figured it out uh, after they had diverged from ants and like mole rats long after they diverged from ants. Yeah, well, so so ants, ants and bees and wasps and horntails and hornets are all one group of insects. Um, and But then like there are some species of bee and wasp that are eusocial and some that aren't. So yeah, I think there was some like splitting there. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, termites are a whole separate group from those other eusocial insects. So I think, yeah, that might've been a moment of like uh, 
convergent evolution. So they, they take different paths to wind up at the same end result. And again, yeah, with the naked mole rats and the, and the other mole rats too, um, cause there's multiple species in Africa. Um, but yeah, that's definitely again, convergent evolution where they just like poof out of nowhere. Um, nobody else in that, you know, phylogeny <laughs> has it. And then all of a sudden they do. So yeah. Yeah. That's why I, um, that's, I, 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 that's why I imagine that if we do ever find alien intelligent life or whatever like that, if we ever go out there, mm -hmm. uh, I still have this idea that given just by like, if you like look by like sheer su like successful models of things on earth and how things have convergently done, like I think we're more likely going to find really advanced you social creatures than like humans because like ours only happened once and it you know the jury's out on whether it's actually successful but like it seems like this like you know um you sociality is pretty successful as a strategy and so um it seemed if it can convergently happen several times on earth i'm sure like s space ants are gonna be a thing <laughs> <laughs> well i mean that's a that's very Ender's Game of you, right? Oh, the buggers, yeah, man, I forgot about that. I haven't. Um, I know this is bad, bad form, but I haven't read. It's I haven't read past the first book on that. Oh, in Ender's Game. Yeah, like, I, I never mean, read. I never read Ender's Shadow or not. What's the second one called? Uh, I don't know. There's like a there's like a million of them now. I, I feel like it was the weirdest contradiction because I started out, well, I mean, I completed in college, I have a bachelor's degree in English literature, and I was like, I love English, I love to read, and then you start majoring in something like that, or I'm sure you feel the same way in history, and all of a sudden it's like, well, here are the things you have to read for class, which leaves you absolutely no brain time or free time to read the things you want to read, and so I feel like... Um, yeah, I have I have this huge list list and also like the physical books on my floor to ceiling bookshelf that I just like have not gotten around to yet and that hurts me inside. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, um that's actually that's actually a little known inside thing from grad school for people that don't go and please don't go. It's no, don't do it. I don't <laughs> uh, I'm not going to agree. Uh, with that. <laughs> um uh Okay, if you're not like part of the very, you have to be a very particular type of person to survive and thrive in that environment. Yes. Um, but one of the things from the inside, one of the first things that a lot of my friends who finish their degrees, um, their advanced degrees do, is go back into reading novels voraciously because you pretty much don't get to read fiction until you're done because there's just, your, your entire life is reading. To the point where when you, whenever you take time off work, you are pretty much doing anything but reading because you just can't look at the text again. <laughs> See, I don't know. I think that might be like because you're in liberal arts grad school. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I still do so much reading um, of papers and things, especially because I'm writing for a big scholarship right now. But I still, I still try to make time for fun reading on occasion, or if not pure fun reading, I'm reading a book to do a review for the channel. Um, yeah. But but it's because a lot of my brain time in grad school is processing specimens or, you know, building an experiment or something like that. So I'm not always staring at a screen or at a page. So I feel like I have, you know, a little more, a little more energy for that leftover. <laughs> Fair enough. I get, you get, you, have, you still have to like, um, like, how many journal articles do you think you probably have to, like, sift through on a regular day? Uh, well, on a regular, like, on a day, that's sort of up to me. Um, mm -hmm. I think there was definitely a progression. Um, like, my first year fall and a little bit into that first spring, it was, like, read papers, read papers, read papers. I think I read... Uh, my, my Mendeley folder, I think has like 45 or 50 papers that I read, um, just so that I could write my project proposal. And that's not including papers that I read, like for my general lab meeting or for classes. Um, and since then I've read a few more papers to try to like bulk out as I'm doing my research and thinking about my proposal. And then, like I said, I'm writing for this big scholarship, which is basically like, 
um, propose a brand new research project. Um, so for that, I've gathered over 100 papers, and I've read like four of them. Um, the scholarship is due in the middle of October, so I'm really on track for that. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm, apl I'm applying for, I'm, is, this, is this for money, right? This is like a grant application type thing? Yeah, it's the, the National Science Foundation has a graduate research funding project thing, so they only, what, thousands of people apply, and I think they give out like 500, but basically it could fund my entire doctoral research, which, like, free money is nice because then you can be like, oh, I could go to literally any university I wanted and study whatever I want, and they'll just be like, yes, please come, because you have money, and yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we have that too, and the due date is also in October, and this year will be the third year in a row I have handed in the exact same application, Woo! and, um, uh, well, the thing is, um, I keep getting it, and then I keep getting waitlisted, and I keep getting so close to getting in that I'm like, like, it's obviously good enough to get through the process, it's just that, um, it just doesn't quite get there, and so I always do, like, minor tweaks to it every year, because I'm always like, it's already good. I just had to like, you know, do it. But that's yeah, that's that, super frustrating. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, that I have been waitlisted for that. Uh, I guess our version of it is split up in a several ways. Like we have, like I think that like scientists apply for something called NCR, NCERC or NCERC, uh, National Sciences and Engineering Research Council, and then I have the. SHRC, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. <laughs> and I think there's a medical one too. And like, uh, though that's the one where like, it's the big government one that like everyone applies for and like a handful of people get. And then um, in ours, there's like a whole Byzantine process where it has to like get out of your department. So you get like ranked in the department before it goes to the university. And then the university can only send a few of those. And then those go to Ottawa. And then Ottawa has like a bunch of people um, like, like there's like levels, so you like get like a notice saying like, oh, your application's like left the department, it's left the university. No, this one, this one is like, it's kind of less stressful on the bureaucracy side of things, but more stressful in that like I, you can only write for this scholarship once. You can either write for it your final year of undergrad, or you can write for it your first year of grad school, or you can write for it your second year of grad school. But once you've submitted one, even if you don't win, you can never submit for it again. Oh gosh, okay. Um, that sucks, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess. It must be hard, because it's, it's like, the United States is a country where you probably have like, a hundred times the people applying for these things, and about half of the actual money to give out. And so it's like, yeah, like you'd have to like, just to handle that much paperwork, I imagine they have to put in rules like that. Yeah, and uh, I'm, I mean, it's the National Science Foundation, so this is like, it's literally, I'm applying against any other kind of math, science, engineering um, person, yeah. And it's undergrads competing against grad students of varying experience levels and from varying backgrounds and uh, you know it comes down to how do people value different kinds of science because like I'm an ecologist and a lot of people are like well why do you know why would we give you money when we could give money to somebody who's um, doing cancer research or you know one of those easy you know, emotional stories. Um, but the, what's interesting about this scholarship is that even though you have to build this really, um, Im, you know, really impressive project proposal, you only get two pages to do it. And that's including the citations for this proposal. So it's not very oh, long. Nice. And the other part of the, the scholarship is a three page personal statement. So they're actually, um, they, I mean, they want somebody who's a good scientist and has a good proposal, but they're also looking for someone who has, like, an interesting life story and um, sounds like they deserve the money. So I think that's that's what's interesting and kind of, like, different about this grant as opposed to others that I've written is that they care a lot more about, like, the person who's doing the science. Yep. And then you also, um, I, okay, uh, I'm gonna we're gonna I'm gonna veer away from uh, talking about applying for funding for the audience's <laughs> sake. But um, then then you like hear about like all this stuff like where you're like you know you're fighting and fighting for these things. And then um, since I have a lot of friends who do biomedical research who actually are doing, I have one, one of my really good friends who's 
uh, just offended uh, maybe a couple weeks ago. He did his research on um, on tau proteins and Alzheimer's and so like you know really big stuff right now, like the whole concussion thing. Um, and God, they have so much money. Like um, I had one friend who was doing, she's doing like breast cancer research and was having some, she was getting grumpy about like only making $35,000 this year in like research grant money. And it's like, uh, uh, and then like how her soup, and then like, and then um, like, mo- like she gets the grant money and then it gets uh, a lot of clawed back, but then she's like going to like her supervisor who has like some like $15 million research project, like, cause they just got grants to just do like, open, like, Wait, if you want to solve a disease, there are so much more money. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Except lung cancer. Apparently, it's really hard to get money for lung cancer research mm. because nobody wants to donate to it. That's weird. Uh, it's a social thing because everybody thinks that uh, it's it's like a thing where oh, there's like, a handful of diseases, lung cancer, they, they think you deserve it. Yeah, that's weird. Mm. Um, and so even for people who don't smoke, who get lung cancer, there's an extreme dearth of research money because people don't donate to lung cancer causes. It's really, it's really, uh, it's really sad. That sucks. (laughs) But the two of us aren't doing our research for the money, apparently. (laughs) No, no. If we're doing it for the money, um, if I was doing anything for money, I wouldn't be doing research. Um, that, yeah. (laughs) All right. Uh, so we got some, okay. So we have. Most are aren't most ants lazy AF. I'm not exactly <laughs> sure. I that sounds like the opposite of what I've been told about ants. I was gonna say, is that like like you want you want me to tell you that you're right and that like this has been a whole conspiracy about like ants not being hardworking. <laughs> I don't. I don't. Ants know are really you're... good at. Yeah, they're super good. They know pick this thing up. If I smelled a trail that went to it and it's a big thing that smells nice, then pick it up and take it back home. Like yeah. I um, I actually do I do a lot of computer programming and science like that kind of stuff in my research and I was just like yeah ants who like are cool for that kind of they're like living computer programs a little bit um I suppose you could make an argument that they're lazy um because like you mentioned the trails so when an ant goes out to forage they leave you know a chemical trail to whatever they found but then like all of the other ants they don't even like look around or like you know they they literally just follow that chemical trail so I suppose you could make an argument for them being lazy and you can actually um there's a cool experiment you can do where you like uh cut a hole in a paper plate and you put some peanut butter down like on the ground in the empty space and you wait until ants have made a a chemical trail back and forth across the paper plate and then you spin the plate a little bit so it makes this break in the chemical trail and they lose their minds they just like can't figure it out um (laughs) so i suppose you can make the argument they're they're a little lazy when it comes to that because like once one of them has figured it out the the rest of them just go on autopilot to get the food so (laughs) yeah so so, yeah ants um we were talking about how uh insects can be really intelligent and it's kind of like in that kind of emergent behavior because even though all of the members of the colony have very simple instructions like i said follow the thing that sm- follow the pheromone smell and then if the pheromone smell ends at a thing that looks like that it smells sweet or good pick it up and take it home and then the more of that smell the more it happens and it's like it, it results in actually pretty intelligent behavior but um you know, you give any individual ant, an individual ant has like no clue what it's doing. It's yeah. It's just kind of just, but what, what about that? What about that one, that enterprising like scout ant? What is, what is, uh, what, is, how do they do that? Um, like, oh, oh, you mean like, how do they find food? Like, how do they, like the, everything you hear about them is they, they follow like the pheromone smells of the one before them. But like, obviously there has to be a first one that does that. Yeah. Um, so we were talking about antenna before. So the antenna aren't on an insect are pretty much their most valuable sensory organ. And um, in animal behavior, we talk about um, two ideas, kinesis and taxis. And so for a lot of insects, and I'm sure ants are the same way, um, taxis is like you can talk about um, moving toward or away from something. So an ant probably has a positive so going towards positive chemotaxis for things that smell sweet, like you said, um, and kinesis is moving like faster or slower. 
So they might also have a, a positive orthokinesis, so they move faster towards things that smell sweet. Um, so it's, again, it's kind of like a program. It's not that the ant is thinking, they just sort of are out there with their antenna going, and if this antenna, you know, smells something sweet, they just go in that direction until they find it. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. And uh, now, now we have a list of theories about how intelligent ants are. So <laughs> they caused the Great Depression. Uh, they did 9-11. And uh, apparently, uh, apparently at one moment it sounded like you said that ants do taxes. Oh, well, I mean, if I could find ants that could do my taxes for me. Yeah. <laughs> As I said, I, I could geek out a lot about the about the um, the weird intelligence that comes out of about insects about um, you social insects because, like I said, that's a weird fascination of mine. Oh yeah. Um. Yeah, and, and there's a lot of times in nature where you find stuff like that, where you have colonies of things following simple rules that result in really complex things. Like, um, I think everyone's going bananas over the slime molds now. Yeah. And yeah. how they can um, they can solve this problem? They're they're finding ways to solve a problem that computer science has been um, doing something that's called a a non n equation. Mm -hmm. So um, in computer science, there's these, there's different types of uh, algorithms or equations to solve, and some are called n equations. So even if you don't know the answer to an equation, you can or uh, an algorithm, you can tell by how you do it that it's either going to take, um, like if you say you need to do something like with one item or with like a thousand items, it's gonna take a linear amount, but then if it's a non-N uh, algorithm, it's gonna be an exponential increase, and some of those are problems that we're not sure, unless there's like some major breakthrough in computer science, there's not going to be a simple solution for it. And this is things like uh, factoring, uh, factoring numbers, like finding the factors for numbers mm -hmm. for large like numbers. That's why we still use factoring large numbers for um, for like cryptography and stuff like that. Yeah. And how you can actually get if you can um, discover new really big prime numbers, you can actually get a lot of money. Uh, so it, there is some money in research if you can um, if you're really good at discovering new prime numbers. Mm -hmm. um, the other one though is something called the traveling salesman problem. And this is really cool. So the traveling salesman problem, like say you had like a bunch of dots on a map and you had to find a way to draw a line between all of those dots and uh, find the shortest way to connect them all without them crossing over. And that is one of those things where the only way for a computer to solve at this point is to just try every permutation. Yeah, which means the more, yeah so the more, uh, the more points you have, the, it gets exponentially worse. Um, until slime molds enter the, the picture, where slime molds kind of like to uh, be blobs. So like, I'm gonna, I, 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 for anyone who's never heard of a slime mold, it is the closest thing to a literal blob as you can possibly think. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's like... It's like bacteria that are in this weird, there's something, some sort of condition that occurs to them where they have to like turn into a blob. It's, I mean, you can say colony. Yeah, that's, yeah. I, Cause I know that like, they're normally not, they normally aren't slime molds. And then there's some sort of like environmental factor that makes them decide to like turn into a blob. Yeah, it's like environmental stressors. Yeah, so then they turn into these things. And one of the things they do is they basically work together to find whatever scraps of food are left over. And what they find is that if you find different food points, they actually solve the traveling salesman problem because they somehow actually find the most efficient route between all of these things. Um, and so they tested it with some real world problems. Like they put, they put them on a map of Tokyo and they put a point of food where all of the stations are in Tokyo. And they found that the slime mold actually pretty closely followed the Tokyo subway system. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah. And now the people are trying, like now there's people who are like biologists working with computer scientists who are trying to find out what it is that like, 
it's not even, this is like, these are not, these are like a colony of single celled organisms. There is no neurons. There's no thinking going on at all. And so like, what is happening to make them make these incredibly uh, difficult decisions for a machine to do? And they're trying to like find what the uh, algorithmic answer is. And, the thing, and they've come to some interesting answers, which is that um, they can answer, they can find solutions to these problems, but they're not perfect, but they're basically good enough. And they found some pretty easy ways to not solve the traveling salesman problem, but get like one that you can guarantee is like 85% likely to be the most uh, optimal answer without having to like do a whole lot more calculation. And like these, these kind of good enough equations are now a thing. I think that's a good, um, that's a good thing to think about when people think about like you were talking about evolution before, like, in nature, people are always like, oh, well, why is that the way that thing is? And, well, because it, it worked. Um, yeah, the, these things are not perfect, and there are a lot of really strange things. Like, if you've ever looked at um, the, the quote-unquote wiring in a giraffe's neck and how all of, like, the nerves and blood vessels go together, it's, like, it's totally not the best way to do things. But, yeah, so much of nature is just, well, that, I mean, it worked, sort of. Yeah, it's <laughs> it works long enough for you to reproduce. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> hence, like um, the the best example of that is why we need antioxidants. Yeah, uh, we need antioxidants, and actually, anti antioxidants help you live long because the way that we metabolize energy is inefficient, and we like literally uh, gunk up our own system with our own things, and so over time, we just build up this crap in our cells because the biochemistry that runs things was only designed to run things for like 30 years tops. Um, you should come and teach metabolism lab to my students this week. <laughs> oh, oh, trust me. I would be so bad. <laughs> I'd be able to say adenosine triphosphate and I would be able to say that uh, something happens that breaks it apart and causes energy, but then fills our cells with free radicals, which eventually kill us. Yep. That's about all I know. <laughs> like, there you go. Two minute lecture. <laughs> Done. <laughs> um, man. Yeah. And so like, that's an example though, is that like, even at the, like, I imagine that ATP stuff is like one of the early things that like, it's probably one of the things that has been uh, evolved for quite a long time. And even after literal, literally over a billion years of happening, it's still like, it still has like massive byproducts and waste and it's not like super efficient, but it's good enough for most things to reproduce. Well, and I mean, it doesn't become a problem until long after you've reproduced multiple times. So why reinvent the wheel? Why fix it, right? There's no, there's no selective pressure on it to get better. So there it mm. is, yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's, where, that's where we have to step in to f solve our own problems. And uh, there are people working on that. There are, um, I knew, I met a few biologists who are working on that, and it's like, oh, geez, okay. Um, the things, one person compared it to rust, that we're, like, literally rusting ourselves because of, like, oxidation of iron or something weird like that, and it's like... <laughs> oh, and this is a question that comes up. Maybe you can explain this in a cool way. Um, a lot of people are talking about... Um, so. Have you seen some of the footage from the hurricanes, like the the multiple hurricanes that have hit your unfortunate country in the last few weeks? A little bit, yeah. There's one picture that someone showed, and it was this kind of flooded out swampy area that was flooded out of Houston, mm -hmm. where there's cakes of fire ants. Fire ants. <laughs> yeah. And like, there's like floating patches of fire ants that like people are trying to like make sure they don't touch. But like they're like clumping up in these like they're almost like they almost look like pond scum from like uh, from like a distance because they're just like making these huge islands of fire ants and I met and there's a lot of people who are interested in that right like that's a thing right now that everyone's yeah well please don't touch them yeah <laughs> so what's the thing. so how do the fire ants do the thing um, <laughs> how do they do the thing well so. Just like I was talking about the spiders in the pitfall traps before, insects are so small, um, especially like their feet are so small that they they can take advantage of the surface 
tension on water and like they can they can float on or walk on water because they're not big and heavy enough to like punch through the way that the water molecules are all sort of bound together because of their electric charges. Um, so like if you throw one ant onto, you know, the surface of a bowl of water or something, it's just going to float there, um, even if it's not on its feet, because again, they're just so light. Um, but yeah, so you can do kind of the same thing with these big groups that they, um, even when there are a lot of them, so they that mass of ants would start to be heavier because it's spread out. It spreads out the weight just like a, a boat does, right, with the way that the hull is shaped. Um, it spreads out the weight enough that they're able to float on top. And uh, army ants in the Amazon actually take advantage of that. So, I mean, I think a lot of people have heard about army ants on, like, a BBC nature documentary. Those, those ones are the comically oversized uh, pincers, right? Yes, yeah, their soldiers have incredible heads, yeah. Um, but and, and army ants are the ones, like, everybody talks about, like, oh, you know, if a, if a bird falls to the fourth floor or something, it'll just be, like, overrun by these things, and they just, you know, they, they swarm it, and army ants are voracious. Um, so they will do this thing called bivouacking, um, when they move their nest. So they'll they'll literally take everybody, the queen, the larvae, the eggs, everything, and they'll just like carry all of it. And you know, when they stop marching for the night, they'll make a bivouac and like the workers will kind of make this weird structure that has the queen and the eggs and the larvae all like inside. But they can do the same thing if they needed to cross a stream or even a river for some reason, they'll make this bivouac um, structure to keep everybody important, safe on the inside, but like the outside ants are just like, well, we're floating down the stream now. Um, so I don't know if bivouac is the right term to use for all of these fire ants, but I, it's basically the same thing is happening, that they're all just, you know, clumped together for mutual safety. Uh, again, something great about eusociality is that like every individual worker is dispensable as long as the group unit is maintained. Um, to pass on those genes. So yeah, they're, <laughs> it's just water tension and, um, and the ants being so small. Yeah. And so I guess a lot of the, uh, in like the hurricane and stuff that a lot of their uh, colonies are getting flooded out. And so they're just clumping up and hanging on for dear life. Yep. <laughs> now I, don't, I know, I know that fire ants are an introduced species from somewhere else. Are they, I don't know where they're from though, but I'm wondering if they're like, because, like, Texas is not a place that is accustomed to getting a lot of rain. And I'm wondering, this feels like some sort of, like, flood adaptation that would be strange for, like, a desert creature. And it's like... Hmm. I, mm, I don't know that it's, like, an adaptation per se, though. Like, I mean, yeah, you're right. So their, their nests flood and all of the ants are washed out into the water. And they start clinging together because that's what they do as, you know, social insects. They all you know, try to be together in the same area. But I think that like the fact that, that they're making these rafts on water might sort of be like a secondary or like surprise side benefit to that. They're, they're just doing, you know, what they would always do. Um, but I don't know that it's an adaptation specifically for like water and flooding. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I remember like people were, cause like when I found out about the fire ant thing, like they were saying that, um, people have studied these fire ant clumps like they're a fluid. Yeah. And so they're able to actually test like the viscosity of a clump of fire ants and like um, they actually fill the container they're in and it's like, oh, that's kind of neat. That's, that's yeah, that's cool. <laughs> um, oh, on the fire ant, or on the uh, army ant thing too, um, this is a cool side that um, I always think about when I think of them and that is the indigenous people who live there use their soldier ants as um, as stitches. Yes. So when they cut themselves, they actually like will have them bite, and then they'll cut off the head, and they'll do it several times to close up like a big cut. It's so weird. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it's clever. Yeah. Are those um? They're like. They're, I, I keep thinking that they're like Amazonian, but they're are they? They're are they from the Amazon? I think so. Yeah. I would like to be in the hut when, like, the first guy is like, hey, you know what we should do to close that wound? <laughs> I invented the staple. Yeah. <laughs> just imagine, like, a far future where, like, um, they've, like, developed, like, offices and they're, like, getting ants to bite pieces of paper together and... <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. 
Also, what's it with it, what's with the Amazon and having colonies of creatures that just devour anything that is alive that gets too close to it? Because um, I'm thinking, like, what is it? It's like fish that do that, or the piranhas do that. It's like, oh so I think the weirdest thing about the Amazon, well, about like that kind of rainforest in general, and people always get really confused by this, but um, it's actually a really nutrient poor system. So like. Those trees are enormous, um, and there's no fall and winter. Like, we're starting to have that here where the trees lose their leaves, but the, there aren't seasons, so the trees don't lose their leaves, and they grow so giant that they sort of pull all of the carbon and nitrogen into them. Um, so there isn't a whole lot of that stuff left. The, the soil is very nutrient poor. Um, there, yeah, there's just, there's not a lot of free carbon and free nitrogen kind of like out there in the system. And so I would imagine, although this is definitely not my area of expertise, I would imagine that that might be part of why those groups of animals work like that is that like when there is some sort of resource input, um, they have to get it like right now before it's gone because somebody else will take it. Um, a lot of, because I, so I study dung beetles for my research and a lot of the papers that I've read have come out of South America and the tropical rainforest and looking at like, oh man, you know, when, when a dung pat gets dropped by an animal or a human, that like dung beetles just like crazy colonize it right away because that is an extremely valuable resource in kind of a desert otherwise. Yeah, I think that, um, that, also, that, would, that also would go a long way to explaining why there's a lot of uh, pre there's a lot of like uh, carnivorous plants in the Amazon mm -hmm. and there's a lot of parasites in the Amazon, mm -hmm. <laughs> including parasite. Like that's where butt flies are from, which are, you know, uh, wow. another, another, um, another insect that comes straight from your nightmare. Uh, that's probably the most terrifying. Do you want me to like mango flies? Those are the two most oh. terrifying things on earth to me. Do you want me to like really ruin your day though? Sure. Because you're busy sitting there in your nice North American Canadian home right now thinking that botflies live in South America and you don't have to worry about them. There are species of botflies that live in North America. Oh, no. Oh, yes. I, uh, <laughs> I, so when I worked, I worked at a wildlife rehab center for a while, which was an amazing experience, and I totally recommend it to people who love animals, but um, <laughs> I was taking care of a rabbit that had been brought into us, and it had been is severely injured by something and it was you know covered in in maggots you know regular fly maggots and so i was disposing of it um when i noticed there was this thing like throbbing in its neck and so i brought it back into our like main exam room to my co-workers and we wound up extracting this bot fly larva that was like probably the size of my thumb so like really really big around and the sort of like mottled grayish green color and it's just this giant maggot that had made a hole in this rabbit's neck from it living in there and we I was like freaking out and we looked it up and yeah sure enough there are bot flies that live in North America so the bot fly um, female will lay her eggs using like a weird glue on the bottom of the abdomen of a mosquito and when the mosquito lands to take a blood meal from any sort of mammal, the mammal's body heat melts the glue and the eggs fall from the mosquito onto the mammal. And then it makes a home in your yeah. pore. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, and so like the thing about the thing about bot flies though too is that their um, their maggots have actually evolved to have their their heads look like their butts and their butts look like their heads. So you have to like you can actually like you have to like tear, and they have like hooks and stuff. Like to take them out is actually pretty difficult. Yeah, um, it was weird. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's nightmare fuel. Um, You're welcome. I don't, I don't really, <laughs> I don't know much about. Uh, yeah, it's them and mango flies. Those are the two that I'm like, oh god. Mm -hmm. Mango flies are worse. I think. I think they like do like that bunches of them. Don't the the picture of the hand that just. Bleh. <laughs> yeah, I. I yeah. Um. <laughs> Yeah, this is why, like, uh, everyone's like, let's go on this magical trip to the Amazon. It's like, nope, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> yeah, I like... What's it called? If we could find a carpet neutral word, just destroy it, I'm good. 
Mm. No, I'm. I mean, that I was would, a joke. Okay. Yeah, I would really like to like canoe down the Amazon someday because I think that would be incredible, and I'd love to visit the rainforest. But yeah, like parasites are really not anywhere near the top of my bucket list. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Amazon's one of those places where, like, if you're gonna go in, you've got to like you, not just anybody can venture in there. And if you want to go in, you got to be really prepared because that place is um. It is, a, it is an ecosystem that is um, harsh in its own very particular way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, because everything, everything is desperate for food and wants to eat you. Mm-hmm. Pretty much. And then also it floods a lot, too. So they, I, I think that... Oh, gosh. <laughs> Great. Botflies exist here, too. That's mm-hmm. Yeah. Lovely. And then we found this crazy thing um, about, I guess, like, bot flies exist in the, the old world, too. So, like, um, one of those ancient Greek guys, like Aristotle or somebody, wrote about bot flies in, like, horse throats or something crazy like that. So, yeah, they live all over. Well, then how come I only ever hear about them in, like, the Amazon? I think they're a lot more prevalent. Um I don't know if maybe the ones here in North America don't do the people thing. I, like I said, the only one I've ever seen was on a rabbit. So I don't know. <laughs> Just one more reason to not get bit my, by mosquitoes, though. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. South America also has vampire bats. Um, that, they're so, like, I think you're onto something with this, like, no nutrients. So they're just, like, trying to find unconventional means to get them because... Yeah. Uh, for like the insect and fruit eating vampire bats, like that's like a, or for bats, like that's an interesting new thing. And they must have, that involves like, I just did some research because I'm doing the vampire video. And um, that would involve like some severe changes to like your liver and like the way that your liver processes food because, um, spoiler alert for everybody, drinking blood is really, really bad for you. Like it, um, because blood is you the, in your liver products. <laughs> yeah, but also like it has so much iron in it that your liver can't process that much iron, and so there must be vampire bat livers must have lots of uh, must have some some way to handle just the raw iron that they get for drinking all that blood. I think if I wasn't studying insects, I would study bats. I love bats; they're so cool. Yeah, I we used to have some that hung out by our house um <laughs> and if we went to bed with the window open you could hear them squeaking around awesome because i kelly was like is that a bird or something and i was like it's too it's too late for it to be birds it's it's bats and they're yep. making them... <laughs> yeah they're cool i yeah. um i had the i had the pleasure of swimming in when i went to mexico um this must have been like two years ago now I got to go to the Yucatan and I got to, and the Yucatan is like um, this kind of porous limestone type of, and so it has a lot of these cave systems called cenotes and I got to swim in one and they just, the bats just like lined the ceiling and they're all just like all hanging out. They're all broing out together. That would be amazing. Yeah, and they, they, they fuel a whole ecosystem because their droppings then feed the whole thing of fish underneath. And yeah, it, it was fun. Um, yeah, go to the Yucatan if you ever can. I was going to say, I'll put that on my list. That sounds great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's a really cool part of Mexico to go to. And um, because the Mex- before uh, when the resort started up probably like in the 1970s, and before the 70s, Mexico hadn't really developed that region very much. So it's this very large region of Mexico that's tropical, and it only has, like, one major city, which is Cancun. Mm-hmm. But, like, many of – if you go out of that city, it's all just, like, resort towns. But that means that all of them, like, the entire uh, human major settlement is all just around the coast. And so – uh, it still has a lot of like really dense jungle hmm. that you can um, sometimes go and visit. And it still has like, because it's like uh, so like 
Mexico didn't pay much attention to this region for a long time, this whole state of Quintana Roo and such. There's a lot more, a uh, lot less like um, colonization in a sense. So like there's still a lot of people who are uh, like ethnically Maya people who have, still speak their language and still like practice some cool syncretic form of their old religion and everything like that. Mm -hmm. And a lot, and it's also a region where a lot of the indigenous like structures and such have still yet to been dug up. So like um, last time I went, which was last summer, uh, the summer that just passed, I climbed a pyramid, a kind of old Mayan pyramid. Uh, and when I got to the top, and if you go to the top, you can actually see the whole canopy of the jungle just off in like all directions. Mm -hmm. And you can actually see like big overgrown lumps and you can actually see like way off in the distance, like there's, still a lot of like these are like Maya ruins that have just not been uh, unearthed yet because there's no mountains it's super flat uh, but there's a lot of really cool stuff there and people are like cave diving like there's huge cave systems there um it's like an eco paradise or well I mean it's an eco tourist paradise if yeah. you can um get away from the spring break part of it <laughs> Oh, that sounds amazing. If you can rent a car and have passable Spanish, you can do a, you can see a lot of really cool stuff there. Yeah. <laughs> but you're you're um you're the kind of person who uh like your whole channel to kind of get back to your own work is about kind of discovering the kind of awesome stuff that's just in your backyard. Mhm. Mm that's actually um <laughs> you, you talking about places you've been that's actually something i want to get into as i like travel around more for conferences and things like that i want to find people and be like um take me on your favorite hike like in your backyard and then do a vlog about like all of these cool natural places that you know people may or may not know exist i think um it was something that was really hard for me and this is kind of why I started the channels that I did. Um, I moved from central Pennsylvania, which I, you know, there was all kinds of natural areas for me to go and explore. And it, it, there were lots of green spaces. And then I moved to just outside of Chicago, which is very, very different. And I was really depressed for a while um, because I didn't feel in my element anymore. And so I had to spend a lot of time sort of going around and, and finding these you know, forest preserves and parks and the green spaces that are here and sort of coming to appreciate um, any sort of green space. Not, I don't, I don't think it's like a, a lowering of my standards or anything. I think it's just understanding that like, this is the situation that so many people in the world deal with is like, you don't have access to some pristine natural area. So it's interesting to sort of investigate all of the little surprising, beautiful things that you can find in the park in your neighborhood kind of thing. Yeah. So that's the, the roving part of the roving naturalist is that I want this to be very vloggy and, and talk about exploring any place that like, you don't have to get on a plane and spend thousands of dollars to go be an eco tourist. You can just do that in any town in the United States or Canada or wherever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, there's, there's all sorts of cool life in all sorts of weird places. Like I'm still surprised that somehow wasps are able to find that they're like the one species it seems that are able to find nests anywhere I go. <laughs> and so even in like downtown Toronto, I, they're still, they're still here. And I'm like, mm -hmm. You'd think that since there's buildings everywhere, that wherever they would put a nest, someone would uh, take care of it. But yeah, they move. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, just like kind of give another to give kind of like more about like the story behind you. I do have to mention we met at VidCon, and this is the kind of oh, um, in real life. <laughs> yes, met in real life at VidCon, and. The best, I think the best story that's very telling of like how you found green spaces and everything like that is that after VidCon was over, we both were in uh, Anaheim for like one more day. And, you know, it's like Disney, it's like Disneyland Central and everything like that. Your choice for your day off was to go on a hike. And so you like found a way to get yourself into the desert or <laughs> into a desert-ish area to like wander around. Mm -hmm. So yeah. like... 
<laughs> That's a good teaser, actually. I'm going to release the first. I, so I, I was such a goofball. I was so tired that day um, because VidCon is such an um, exhausting experience. Even it's great, but um, yeah. So I was a little silly, um, but it was just me like going for a hike in this nature area that I found. Um, so I took like like two hours of vlog footage. <laughs> <laughs> and I've just finished editing them, so I'm going to publish the first vlog from that this week. Um, so you can see me be goofy in a habitat that I'd never really experienced before. Th that was very exciting for me. I got to see cacti and some different birds and insects and things that I'm not used to seeing. And I also get to complain about how hot it is in Southern California, um, although it's really hot outside in Illinois right now, too. So, <laughs> um, But yeah, so that, that was... I, I, I mean, I like amusement parks and roller coasters, but oh. yeah, the choice between Disney World and experiencing a new ecosystem, no contest. <laughs> All right, I think the last little, the last like bit of that sentence there, you turned into a cyborg and spoke super fast. Oh no! I think there was a compression <laughs> problem. <laughs> oh no! But, I was just go for it. No, no, no. I didn't know oh. what I was gonna say. No, I was just, yeah, I was saying that, like, the, the, the choice between going to Disney World and experiencing an ecosystem that I hadn't seen before, there was no contest. <laughs> That's, that, that'd be a fun one to go into. Is that, um, is that, like, rattlesnake country and everything, too? Um, I mean, maybe, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so much of the ecology of North America changes when you cross the Rockies from one side to the other. Uh, so I don't really know. And that was the, that was the most fun thing about that vlog for me is that like the whole time I'm behind the camera, like, Ooh, look at this amazing thing. I have no idea what it is. I'm going to go home and look it up on the internet. Oh, there's something else amazing that I've never seen before. And like, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I didn't see a rattlesnake. Um, <laughs> And that day after VidCon, well, a couple things. You were saying how hot it is in Illinois. It is also hot here. It is in Toronto in late September with the Humidex 40 degrees. Wow. Um, it's just like, no, no, don't do this to me. No, let's see. Mine says, what did it say? There's pumpkin spice lattes now. Now you can't be 40 degrees anymore. <laughs> Um, yeah, this says that the, it's 91 Fahrenheit, which is almost the same Celsius. Yeah. So it's hot. It's hot. Yeah. I am wearing a tank top in September. <laughs> My students keep coming to class uh, with flip flops on and I'm just like, no, we're doing lab, but you can't wear flip flops. Oh no. Am I related to Ken Bone? Oh my. What? <laughs> Okay. Do you remember? Do you do you remember Ken Bone? Who is Ken Bone? Ken. Okay. So Ken this. Bone. So okay. Uh, he was a celebrity for all of two weeks. Oh um, my gosh! In the yes. maelstrom of the 2016 election, for being this guy with like a mustache, he was like an un undecided voter, like in October of the presidential election, and. He like asked some question about like why can't we all just like get along and everything. like he just sounded so nice and he had this like mustache and he like wore this like bright red sweater. I see the I see the picture. Yeah. <laughs> and and then um, like he was just like known as like everyone was just like how is there like this this wonderful like angel of a person who like has no politics and is like nice and wants everyone to get along and then. Um, then someone found his Reddit and turns out that he was into some like really weird stuff. <laughs> and it's just like, the story is just like, it was like, it, it was just so, man, 2016 was a weird year in so, so many ways. Yeah. Um, the fact that like Ken Bone wasn't even the biggest thing of 2016, like that was the year that Harambe happened. Like that was a year. There were, yeah, there were so um, many things. <laughs> um, I don't know. That's just a troll. <laughs> oh, man. Any less weird questions? Yeah, let's have some questions about some, about, about bugs. Yeah. And, I, uh, and environment and such. If you need, um, topic starters, I research dung beetles in the prairie. So the tall grass prairie covered 
um, a good portion of the Midwestern North America, so the United States all the way up into Canada, and there was what we call like the, the Prairie Peninsula, so sort of like a um, an offshooting of it that reached all the way out into Illinois. And historically, so like before white settlers, um, something like 99% of Illinois was covered in tall grass prairie. Um, of that tall grass prairie coverage, we have less than 0.1% of it remaining like the stuff that was there before. It's all been plowed under for agriculture. Um, so I'm studying an area where the Nature Conservancy um, is restoring prairie. And there are people in my group looking at the restoration of the plants, of birds, of small mammals. Um, we have a herd of bison that were um, translocated into the restored prairie a few years ago. And so I'm looking at how the dung beetles are reacting to the re-addition of the bison and also things like prescribed fire regimes that help maintain the plant structure of the prairie. Um, so you could ask me questions about all of those things. I've also worked at nature centers. I worked at a zoo. I worked at an aquarium. I worked at a wildlife rehab center. <laughs> yeah. You are that cheery person in the uniform that the kids talk to at every single place. Hello, Jane. Um, <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, there's a couple things I could talk about that. Because like, on this channel, we talk a lot about the Colombian exchange. Mm -hmm. And you are just talking about basically how this region has been severely affected by the Colombian exchange with um, yeah. huge, like basically a complete environmental turnaround. So are these, are, are dung beetles a pre-Columbian species? Were they there before contact? Yeah, yeah, um, well, yes and no. So <laughs> um, a lot of what we have to go on as far as like what was in North America before white settlers got here is based on journals of white settlers as they explored across the wilderness. And um, that works really well for some of the plants and a lot of the megafauna like deer, elk, moose, wolves, coyotes, bison. Not a whole lot of people write about insects in their journals. You know, if you're a farmer from the, you know, 1600s or whatever, you're not going <laughs> to write about the bugs. Um, so it's a little difficult to know for sure. Um, but yeah, a lot of the species that I'm looking at seem to sort of have have hung on. Um, but there is a really interesting paper that I wrote or that I read that was about um, it's called like what happened to the uh, to the North American bison, and it was talking about that like because bison almost went extinct, right? And um, when their numbers were cut that low, we pretty much assumed that if there were any dung beetles that were specialized to specifically have a relationship with bison as opposed to just with any cow type creature, um, that those dung beetles might have gone extinct without anybody knowing. Um, so there's a lot of thought that all of the dung beetles that are left are what we would call generalists. So if the bison weren't there, but there were cattle, you know, on ranches or dairy farms that the dung beetles were able to subsist on their poop. Um, so maybe all of the species that we have left are the ones that were able to find alternative resources when the bison disappeared, which is kind of sad. So it's not necessarily an exchange as in like, um, there were invade in invasive dung beetle species, but more like, the ones that couldn't cope with there not being bison um, disappeared. Hmm. Yeah, there's um. I know that there's um. There's a story about when it comes to like years you're doing habitat restoration. There, um, there's a Russian guy who had bought a whole bunch of those bison uh, because he's trying to recreate a Pleistocene sort of yeah. <laughs> thing in Siberia, which I think is kind of neat. Um, so then. These are different than like the dung beetles that like ancient Egyptian people worshipped and such. Yes. Um, well, yes and no. So there's a there's a rainbow scarab that we have that may or may not be like a similar rainbow scarab to one that exists in Africa. It's very difficult because um, a lot of insects don't have common names, which like does and does not make it complicated. So like, I mean, I can say, oh, well, the rainbow scarab that I have is Phaneus vindex, and that's the species name that it's got. But like, I I haven't really looked at what, um, what species they have in like Egypt or other parts of Africa in terms of like trying to compare for whether or not these are native. Um, so it might be the same rainbow scarab, but I'm not sure. Um, 
I'm not so much concerned with, and this is this is something that a lot of people find hard to understand about restoration ecology, um, but it's almost impossible for us to be like, I'm going to put this prairie back exactly the way it was before white people got here and boom, like that's not, that's not a realistic set of expectations because it's such a ridiculously difficult thing to accomplish. So what my research group is more interested in is this idea of ecosystem functionality. Um, so not just does this ecosystem look like it used to, but also does it act like it used to or act like it should or act in a way that is sustainable. Um, so I'm not necessarily concerned so much with um, whether or not the species of dung beetles that exist in my research plots are exactly the kinds that should be there, but whether the species that are there are all working in their own little resource niches um, to do their function. And of course, the function of dung beetles is to decompose dung. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm looking at how all of the different species that do or do not show up in my research sites do a good job of, um, decomposing dung. So yeah, it's, it's hard for a lot of people to be like, oh, like you're totally okay with that species that doesn't belong there. Um, but at this point we have so few to pick from that I don't feel like I can be choosy. <laughs> okay, cool. Cool. So then like say like you're doing something with um so with like scarabs or dung beetles or whatever cool name you want to give them <laughs> um then say like there's a species like say you didn't have any dung beetles to choose from then you just go with a species that does something similar like maybe some sort of like earthworm or um trying to think of some other ones like that be good for that kind of job but like you try to find like you try to like if you saw that something was missing you try to like find some sort of decomposer to like introduce or to uh i'm not i'm not at the point of like being like hey we should reintroduce this thing although that is totally what happened in australia so if you think about it um australia evolved with all of these like all the marsupials and they've got you know one kind of poop and then white people came and started doing the whole sheep and cattle thing and australia was being buried in poop uh, it's kind of a big problem. Um, so they wound up actually like introducing, I think there was something like 38 species of dung beetle from Africa and North and South America, all over the world. They pulled dung beetles and brought a whole bunch of different species to Australia and introduced all of them. And only like five or six of them su succeeded and established. But yeah, like without those dung beetles, there wouldn't have been any regular like usable pasture land left in Australia because the native dung beetles were not able to take on all of that cattle and sheep dung. Um, so re reintroduction or, 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 or just introduction of a new species is something that people do. I'm more interested in um, what we can do as we restore the prairie um, from the land manager's perspective to help make it a better place for the dung beetles that already are on this continent to get there. And what kind of stuff can you do? Um, so, I mean, reintroducing the bison was huge. Um, a prairie without bison doesn't have a whole lot of resource for the dung beetles. They can eat the dung of other smaller animals, but, I mean, the bison pats, they're, they're big, and those are very useful, especially because some of the dung beetles actually lay their eggs directly into that pat, and then, like, the adults live in there with the baby. So, like, it has to be a bigger, a bigger pat in order to sustain a good population. So yeah, adding the bison back in is good. Um, thinking about having continuous or like adjacent patches of prairie as opposed to having them very like scattered and sporadic because dung beetles can't fly all that far. Um, thinking about, and this is something my research is looking at, whether or not um, burning, because um, land managers burn the prairie to keep um, trees from growing because then it wouldn't be a prairie anymore. It'd be a forest. Um, but we wonder about like the timing of a burn in the year, but also the frequency of like how often a site is burned over the years, um, how that might affect the dung beetles. Like is burning a little too often bad for them and we should sort of cut back stuff like that. Um, but yeah, those are, those are all of the questions that I'm interested in. Yeah. There's actually a cool thing about burning that uh, came up when I was reading 1491. That was, that the burning, like the regular burning of the a lot of the grassland in the United States, or what would become the United States, was done by humans because humans wanted to um, 
basically, you know, promote the kind of plants that they wanted to eat. And um, there's much, it's much easier to find food in a prairie than in like a forest. And so there's like actually like some evidence that the indigenous peoples over like the millennia had deforested a lot of America to turn it into prairie. And some evidence that there were actually like bison all the way to the East coast at one point. Yeah. Wood bison. Yeah. But then, um, what happened was that when the Columbian exchange began, especially when it came to the disease factor, when you had about 80 to 90 plus percent of the indigenous population dying, um, they stopped doing a lot of the things that they were doing. But by that point they had become a keystone species. Yep. And so, a lot of those prairies, this is probably where like a lot of those, like, as you were saying, like this is where like Illinois got all those forests started popping up. And now there's the theory that um, all of that like regrowth of forest sequestered so much carbon out of the atmosphere that um, if you look at from that period onwards, if, like maybe like a few centuries after contact, you have a period of extreme temperature drop. The little ice age. Yeah, and yeah. that there's people who think that it might be because so much carbon got sequestered into uh, trees after the decimation of the indigenous population of the Americas. Like about, like we don't we don't talk about it in like the big scale. Like the Columbian Exchange resulted in one fifth of the human population going uh, dying out in a very short period of time. Yeah, we were just talking about that. Um, I'm taking an environmental management class, and we talked a lot about like oh. Um, how different historians estimate the population of the Americas pre-white settlement and how, like, that's become a huge argument among people, I guess, trying to estimate how many people were killed by different diseases. And I thought that was so interesting that people are sort of, like, like getting really nasty in the history world trying to do these estimates. And I just I didn't realize that that was something to get your anchor up over. <laughs> yeah, I... Um, it you should see my comment section sometime. I made a video on that topic and it has gotten a lot, and I mean a lot of hate because um, to be like, you know, the reasonable academic, I just used the whole range and said up to. And so I said that like estimates on how many people died range from up to 100 million people because that was like, that's the high end estimate that there was about 100 million people in all of the Americas. And that interprets an internet land into 100 million people died. I am 100% sure in this video. And um, <laughs> then, and, and um, the YouTube algorithm and all of its infinite wisdom decided that this video performs really well when put in suggested videos alongside like YouTube neo-Nazis. Oh no. And so not only people who are seeing that video are like really like angry because of the whole history war that's going on, but also it's people who are predisposed to be rather defensive about white supremacy and stuff like that, because they're like literal neo-Nazis coming to my channel and uh, talk about it. So it's a toxic mix. Oh man. Yeah. The way they decide but, what is uh, successful in a video is really exciting. Yeah. Uh, but the reason why historians are fighting about that so much is because it does have a lot to say about, um, like, depending upon how we interpret this event, there's a lot of ways to um, see it as a politi in politics, specifically um, what sort of debts and obligations we have towards Indigenous Americans. Mm -hmm. So if this is a population that has that had as many as a hundred million people that got wiped out by disease, then it uh, conflicts with the previous story, which we had, which was that we had uh, a much smaller population of indigenous Americans and that they were wiped out primarily due to war mm -hmm. with, with white settlers. It and so changing the dynamic to say that, uh, the story of colonization was one of like one of genocide and one of uh, like this huge like it, ma it makes it much bigger than it was, a and it was already really big. And so, if you're a person who says, say, um, 
you have a lot of like, you know, strongly held opinions about, you know, indigenous people in this continent about like what sort of things that can be expected to um, get from the state that have colonized them. Uh, it affects the, uh, it affects it a lot. And also, um, it, 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 there's always been a political charge to like what was the history of uh, Native indigenous American people because of the destruction. And so like, I guess like the reason why such a fight is because we're basically fighting over how big of an impact was white settlement. Mm -hmm. um, and it that makes can be pretty big. Yeah. It makes me think of the book uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel. I had to read that in undergrad and I I don't know I have mixed feelings and I, I feel like that's one of those books I have to go back and read a second time but it, it like some of the attitude in that book really struck me and um, this whole population thing makes me think like oh yeah if that many people were killed off and that the population was absolutely decimated and super weakened and and not organized anymore then it made it like way easier for the white settlers too. And then it sort of takes away from that like grandiose, like, ooh, we were the superior ones and we came in and like beat them up kind of thing, right? Like if they if they had been so much stronger and the disease did all the work kind of thing, so. Yeah, um, <laughs> and there are some records that show that up. Like um, there was a Spanish explorer that explored um, sort of what would today be the American Southeast, like, um, what would be today probably like Alabama and like Louisiana and such. And what they discovered was like this region that was like fairly developed, like roads, towns, cities. And then, um, you know, they did, they weren't going into like conquering anything. This is literally just like, we're just going to wander around and see what's, what's over here. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I think like 30 or 40 years later, they came back and there was nothing there. And so there's like a lot of evidence that a lot of that the concept that we had that indigenous peoples were this undeveloped kind of hunter gatherer uh, nomadic society that was just a very small amount of people that we just kind of walked in and took all this land they weren't using um, is actually challenged by like, there was actually a thriving developed and large civilization that had severely affected the environment and, you know, had like, like it wasn't like a group of people like of like, you know, forest nymphs living in the forest and like using all of the animal and like all of that kind of stuff. But it was like, you know, real empires, countries, um, you know, towns, like real civilizations that aren't like these myths that we built up. And then it was, um, and I, I, I'm hesitant to blame like white settlers for disease because they didn't know what disease did back then. And yeah. <laughs> it was not, it's kind of one of those things that would have happened even if we had met under the nicest of circumstances. But it, it was probably one of the, I think that what it does, and this is the one thing that, uh, why I find it so fascinating is that it's probably one of the most significant events in biological history that happened. Like it, it's probably like, if you were to like rank effects that humans have had on the natural world, that has to be like one of the highest, um, one of the higher things we've done, because as you meant, as you, you've kind of talked about a little bit, like this is an ex this the Colombian exchange, the whole like moving of species and everything across the world have, um, like it's just it's been every, like it's still going on today. Wow. <laughs> I did get a question that someone asked about uh, if you know of any old world or sorry. Uh, like reverse uh, in introductions. Like if there's any if there's any American uh, flora or fauna that got moved over to like the old world in some way. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so I mean, they're like the really classic ones, but I feel like a lot of people still don't know about them. Uh, everybody loves tomatoes in their Italian food, but like Italy didn't have tomatoes. Those are from those are from North America and Middle America and same thing like with like potatoes and stuff. Um, so there's a lot of really good like food staple examples of um, things that were transmitted back. Um, chocolate too. Uh, yeah, things that they didn't have over there but like found here and we're like, hey, this is really delicious. Like we should probably have this. Um, so yeah, like I feel like um, those food examples are the big ones that people always talk about. 
Um, one that I think is really interesting, though, that isn't good, because um, those are all like, oh, well, we intentionally brought them back because they were delicious, right? Um, pine trees are from North America, right? Um, but they were accidentally introduced to Africa and have become a huge problem as an invasive species there that um, they take water up from the ground differently than most of the native trees and shrubs in Africa do. And so they wind up creating like little desert areas around them that they, uh, yeah, they wind up stealing a lot of the water out of the soil. And so the native plants don't grow. And also uh, pine trees are super acidic. If you've ever been in like a, a Northern hemlock forest, you might've noticed that the water um, in streams and swampy areas can be kind of orange. That's tannic acid. So it comes from a lot of those coniferous trees and those um, acids and chemicals, they actually leach them into the soil around them. And that helps prevent other plants from growing around those trees to fight off competition. But again, it, it really changes the soil chemistry in Africa. So I think that's, that's a really odd example of something that came from the new world and was transmitted back to the old world and is now causing problems for people. And it's also weird because it's, again, like, oh, it's something environmental happening in Africa, so nobody's talking about it, which is sad. Well, is that acidic, <laughs> is it acidic reason why um, it's considered pretty unpleasant to burn pine wood? Um, probably, yeah, they, I, it's got, um, it's got pitch in it and the acid in it. So it just, um, it gets very acrid smelling when you burn pine if you don't do it right yeah um or i mean if you've sat under a pine tree before you might have noticed that there's not a whole lot even grass doesn't grow under pine trees because there's just so much acid in the ground so yeah they're uh they're very good at preventing competitors from growing around them <laughs> yeah okay so i i learned a lot today including that <laughs> pine trees are dicks <laughs> um that's a good video title. <laughs> Pine trees are that, that. I think that'd be a great video. I think that that that's the kind of stuff that I think that would be really great uh, as a roving naturalist discussion. <laughs> um, I do remember, um, despite the fact that this was a terrible book and written by a person who was going procedural procedurally crazy before he died. Um, Michael Crichton uh, wrote a book, uh, his big climate change denial book. Like he wrote a novel. He wrote a novel about eco terrorists. Um, but it was a terrible book. But I remember I read it, and um, I do remember that it introduced me to the idea that like trees are uh, perennially being jerks to each other and always trying to like destroy other ones, other trees, and like um, like that they're they they they're basically like these giant hogs that. Uh, pretty much like bully all the other plants out of any, everything like sunlight and nutrients. And uh, they just like soap up everything they can and just keep it in these like huge trunks. And then basically are like, ah, nothing for anyone else. I think, um, yeah, that's true in a lot of circumstances. There's some really interesting stuff that's been coming out in, you know, like the past 10, 15 years though, about how trees can um, communicate between one another or even like work together sometimes. So I, I don't know that we could say they're, they're jerks in all circumstances. <laughs> um, yeah. And I mean, what trees get parasitized by lots of plants and fungi and insects and stuff. So, I mean, they're, they're certainly getting as good as they give. Yeah. Um, are you, are you talking about like rhizomes and stuff like that too? Like that, that's a whole nother thing. That's another keg to tap. That, that's a whole another thing. Yeah. That's, um, that's a, a symbiotic relationship or a sharing relationship with a uh, bacteria that grow, like live in their roots. And yeah, that's, those are, yeah, that's, that's them sort of working together. But yeah, the, there's stuff about like that, um, trees are able to communicate like where the roots from one tree meet up with the roots of another tree in the soil that they're able to like pass chemical information back and forth. Um, and also some weird stuff about like trees in one forest getting stressed out because of, I don't remember if it was a disease or, or a fire or something, but like trees in a, a distant area somehow had received like chemical like distress signals from the trees that were being hurt and they had like changed their growing patterns because of it it was really odd um but yeah so there's a lot more going on than we think <laughs> yep oh there you go i got there's the there's the uh, out of context quote pine trees equals the devil um <laughs> Have you seen the thing Hank, Hank Green is like, oh my gosh, somewhere on the internet, 
there's got to be like a cache of all of these random things that I've said, but out of context. <laughs> I worry. Awesome. I worry so much about that. <laughs> no, I, I, that that whole pine tree thing you said. That's like completely. I had never heard of that before, and that's like the thing that I'm gonna be like Wikipediaing later today. Yeah. All right, we have about ten minutes left, so. Uh, Let's take some last questions, and I want I want Cheryl to talk more. Um, she's, <laughs> Said she's nobody been, ever. <laughs> no, 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 no. It was, I I want um, I want some I want more people to like I want like I want to sell your channel a lot more to these Aww. people who are watching. So, um, so like, what kind of subjects? So you, uh, what kind of subjects do you want to talk about? About like you said, you're gonna do some sort of these kind of like nature vlogs, and you can go hiking. Yeah, um, so I um before I even actually like made the channel go live, I, I had a very exciting summer. I went to VidCon and met Tristan and everybody else and I went on this hike and then I um as part of the day when I went on the hike, I also dipped my toes in the Pacific Ocean for the first time, which was very exciting. And then two weeks later I was back on the West Coast for a friend's wedding in Oregon. Uh so I went to the Pacific Ocean again. And I also spent um, some time hiking in the forests in Oregon and looking at waterfalls and things. So I have a whole bunch of really nice vlog material that I'm going to be releasing over the next few weeks about me exploring some places I haven't been before. But I'd also, like I said, I want to do some vlogs just like me walking through the forest, the, the local forest preserve that's my favorite place to go hiking and just like geek out over plants and things because, I mean, there's amazing stuff to see. Um, I'm also, I'm taking a mycology course right now, so that's the study of fungi and mushrooms. So I'm hopefully going to vlog a little bit as I'm out in the woods collecting mushroom samples for my lab collection, uh, so for an assignment, but still really interesting to look at mushrooms. I think um, that would be really cool with that, and if you want to like do like a side video, and it'd be super practical, and that is, I know that there's like a movement of like people who like to get into going into the woods and getting mushrooms for food. Foraging, yeah. You could. Yeah, why don't, maybe maybe that that feels like something that would be a natural thing to go alongside with that. Be like, this is food. This is not food. <laughs> this is I, a um, <laughs> this is a to oh, death school or whatever it's called. Yeah. Um, oh, the the destroying angel. Yeah, those are those are bad news, man. Uh, uh, a piece of one of those mushrooms the size of your pinky nail can kill you. And it's like a horrific death too. It's like like really bad, like stomach cramps and vomiting and like oh, it's horrible. Yeah. So don't the question about that though: What if it tastes really good? <laughs> like you know, nobody who's done it would ever know. But what if it does? Like what if it's just amazing? Yeah. No. I nope. Don't do it. <laughs> it would have to be really, really amazing to counteract all of that terribleness. Um, yeah. I don't. I've been thinking about doing like an an urban foraging. Um, episode because I am really interested in that but I would definitely I think I would stick to plants um, fungi are just like really really I mean they're really really dangerous but also um, for every delicious one there's a look-alike that can kill you not just a look-alike that isn't edible as in like oh it'll make you sick but like it could kill you and that I'm just not I'm not about giving people advice on stuff like that I don't want to be responsible for someone making a mistake and uh, and hurting themselves like yeah, I think, um, yeah, I would do urban foraging about, like, you know, dandelion leaves, and, and I, I'd like to try eating cattail, root, or cattail roots and stuff like that. So I, that kind of stuff, yeah. Um, I don't know about mushrooms. <laughs> yeah. Can we do one here where, like, I have to, like, look for, like, a half-eaten shawarma that's been thrown on the sidewalk or something? <laughs> like, urban foraging? <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, like, I mean, like, foraging in the parks. Um <laughs> Hopefully you don't have to be like that the rat in the subway video with the slice of pizza. <laughs> <laughs> How to become pizza rat. <laughs> and uh, you just recently had an interview with one of your friends. You're gonna have some more of your uh, some more of your scientist buddies talk about their work. Yes. Um, so that's the I decided to call it explain yourself because it's gonna give all of these. Um, <laughs> so I'm a science grad student who started out as a science communicator and kind of went like backwards, but most science communicators I'm meeting or, or like potential science communicators are scientists who haven't really thought about like how to explain 
what they do to other people. Um, so that's why I've started this Explain Yourself series. So it's mostly going to be interviews with grad students, although I, I may occasionally have some professors and um, you know later career people on. But yeah, just giving them a chance to explain their science in a way that's accessible to maybe a non-science specific audience, um, talk about their experiences as grad students, because lots of people are curious about what it's like and there hasn't been a whole lot of information I didn't really know what I was getting myself into when I started this so I feel like I try to like I said I want to give people that like insider perspective on what it's like to be a scientist and be a grad student so yeah I'm, I'm really I'm jazzed about these interviews and I started with Anna because she's the other master's student in my lab with me so we've been hanging out for like a whole year together um so it was it was really chill it was basically us doing what we normally do but with my camera in the room so uh, yeah, I hope people really enjoy that. I know she and her friends and family have already thought it was really funny. Um, but I'm gonna do a whole bunch of the other grad students that are in my research group. And then I'm going to a conference in November, which I'm super excited about. Um, and it's a conference for all other people who study insects. And I'm gonna put the call out on Twitter for um, grad students who are attending that conference. If they wanna come find a quiet corner with me and my camera, we can do an interview. Cause I think these are, it's a really good practice for them to explain their science. Um, and it's a nice thing to have that video that you can put on your resume later and be like, hey look, I did this thing. Here's me talking about my science. So yeah, those are a ton of fun. Nice. So they got a lot of material to do. Yeah. <laughs> Are you going to um, go back to any of your old haunts? Go um, back to the zoo and go back to... <laughs> Hopefully as I have time. Um, I haven't decided if I just want to go back and like vlog or if I want to be like, like send an email to someone that I used to work with and be like, hey, do you want to like do an interview and like a behind the scenes thing? I used to... Um, I used to be in charge of leading a behind the scenes tour in the shark area at the aquarium, which was just... Oh, such a great experience. I really loved that. And the people who work back there and take sh care of the sharks and the corals and things, they're amazing people. So I think it would be fun not just to like go to the aquarium as a tourist, but actually get to like talk to them about how they care for the animals and all of the cool stuff that they're learning. Because um, zoos and aquariums are a great place to do scientific research on animals too. So yeah, I think, I think that could be cool. I'd like to do that. Test the new people. Make sure they're <laughs> as good as you are. <laughs> Make sure they got all the stories down. Yeah, right. All right, and so before we say goodbye, can you tell everybody where to find all of your things? Yes, you can find me on YouTube. I'm The Roving Naturalist. You can find me on Twitter. I'm at R-V-I-N-G Naturalist. Um, and you can find me on Facebook and Instagram as The Roving Naturalist as well. I post pictures and links to my videos. Uh, I think I'm most active on Twitter. I share articles sometimes and stuff too on there. So, But you can find me in all the places. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, to everybody who is watching, I want to thank... Cheryl so much for coming and sharing so much fun science with us today. And of course, uh, thank you guys so much for being subscribers to Step Back for one more month. Trust me, there's many more to come. We're going to have a good time. Thank you. Thanks.